Mark Stein live on GB News TV and simultaneously live on GB News Radio. Lord Frost was Britain's chief negotiator for exiting the European Union. He has a slightly amorphous presence in the public mind because he was a diplomat who became a sort of advisor and then a sort of minister and then a cabinet minister, all while holding down that Brexit portfolio. But the gist of it all seemed to be that it was the man who mattered and the office was merely tailored to him. Being a Minister of the Crown, of course, pales in comparison to his uh, sometime job as uh, Chief Executive of the Scotch Whiskey Association. So I raise a tumbler to you uh, in memory of your days uh, with the Scotch Whiskey guys. At that time, they were... Um, they were basically inclined more toward the EU than you were, uh, I think it's true to say. Yeah, they probably were. Great to talk to you, Mark. Uh, they probably were uh, a bit, mm. but they're one of the few trade associations that isn't up for just protecting the industry. They want free trade, they want low tariffs, they want lots of exports. So in that sense, they're, they're part of what Global Britain is trying to do now. Well, you, you uh, in your last few months in office, were giving all these rather interesting, uh, if underreported, speeches hither and yon. And uh, there, were a couple of, there were a couple of phrases there that leapt out at me. I think you said this in Lisbon. Brexit is about doing things differently, not for the sake of it, but because it suits us and because it creates a greater variety of alternative futures. That's an intriguing phrase, a greater variety of alternative futures. Uh, wh wh what do you mean by that? So Brexit was about bringing politics home. It was about bringing democracy back to Britain so we could set our own rules, uh, make our own destiny in the world again. And that means that we've got to win the arguments here again. For people like me, that means winning the arguments for free markets, for freedom of speech, for um, free economies. But other people don't think like that. We've, we've got to win those arguments. So in that sense, there's a variety of futures. But they're futures that we choose now as British people forging our own destiny in the world, making our own, our own future and succeeding or failing on our own two feet. It's a slightly intriguing phrase to use in late 2021, though, because there's, I doubt there's ever been a time across the Western world where on the principal issue, which is the COVID, there was a one-size-fits-all public policy imposed everywhere except Sweden. Uh, that's kind of odd, isn't it? Yeah, we've been through a very unusual period, obviously. And um, <clears throat> I think when we look back at... Uh, the last couple of years, we look back at the decisions that have been taken on COVID, we're going to think this was a pretty major public policy failure, uh, a disaster almost. And, you know, we now know that the lockdowns, those sort of NPI measures don't work. The evidence for, the, for them working is, is not at all strong. And... Um, we know that they come with all kinds of bad consequences. And those, that's what we're going to be living through. And one of the things that I found personally quite unnerving and worrying about the last um, two years is the lack of debate, the squeezing out of alternative views, the inability to kind of talk honestly about some of the things that have been, been going on. And I think there's a, a mix of reasons for that, but it's extremely troubling for people who believe in freedom. And we've, we really must draw a line and move on and never go back. Well, I think you described yourself as a free speech uh, zealot. And, uh, and that's certainly how I feel uh, about it, a free speech. I don't think I'm a free speech absolutist because I don't think what we're seeing now, I mentioned earlier, this Ontario judge who's who's basically forgiven, for, forbidden a dad to criticise the government in front of his 10-year-old son. There doesn't seem to be a, a culture of free speech in countries that once took that for granted, by which I mean 
essentially the Anglophone democracies. Are you concerned about that? Yeah, I'm extremely concerned. I mean, when I was young, you used to people hear people saying all the time, it's a free country, when people said something they didn't agree mm. with. And you don't hear people saying that quite as often as, as I used to. And I do think it's, you know, there, there are some rather strange pathologies being released in the, the last couple of years that, that go to the heart of what, you know, what it means to be a Western society. What has made us successful is the ability to debate things, to, you know, to argue things out, to find new solutions, to test things and to move forward as the evidence dictates. And, you know, the, the, the last couple of years have been very strange from that point of view, not just the, the clampdown by social media companies on unapproved opinions, such as the source of the... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, the original uh, virus, but but also, what seems to me, you know, governments being very slow to accept new evidence, to adjust their positions as new evidence has come out, to communicate it. For example, they've been quite slow to acknowledge some of the, you know, the fact that the the um, the vaccines don't pre prevent transmission as well as the as we thought. Mm. They've been quite slow to communicate effect, real information about things like the case fatality rate, basic information about it. The governments have not pushed out that in a honest and open way. And I, I find this all extremely troubling. And that's why, that's why I, I, I left government when we seem to be going back down that track again on, on the Plan B uh, ideas last month. And I think it's so important that we repeal the legislation that we we don't continue with with sort of zombie policies like the jabs for, for jobs thing in the nhs we move on and draw a line and i think for all the difficulties we've had in this country we have shown that in parliament we can still debate things the debate has never been entirely crushed mm. here and there have always been mps who've been willing to speak out and i think opinion is now turning and I'm, I'm not surprised, indeed, I'm, I'm really pleased that this country is, is following countries like Sweden and, as you say, Florida, the state in the US. That is really good. And it's, it's a tribute to the strength of our political culture. And we've, we've, we've got to keep building on that. Well, it's, it's one part of the UK. It's, it's England, uh, Scotland. Northern Ireland and Wales have generally been far more alarmist on it. And, and you know, I'm sure because we, we certainly get emails and tweets about it, there's a lot of people who can't figure out why all Western governments, with very few exceptions, are behaving exactly the same. They're saying, well, what's happening? Is, is everyone getting their orders from Chairman uh, Xi or that Klaus guy at uh, Davos or what's what's but uh, I take it you would subscribe to the view that uh, for some reason there's just a group think among the Western leadership class generally? Yeah I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist obviously and I don't think you need to resort mm. to conspiracies mm. to explain what's gone mm. on. I think you just look at the pressure on politicians to um, do what they're doing, what is happening elsewhere, to follow suit, to take what seems to be the kind of lowest political risk approach to things in the short run, and um, thereafter to double down on it. It's always difficult for government to admit it got things wrong, to adjust positions, to change. And I think we're, we're seeing that. Uh, obviously, in the UK, we're seeing, you know, th there's always a wish for... Uh, the devolved administration, Scotland, Wales, and so on, to differentiate themselves in some way. And I think we're seeing that additionally as well here. But but I think you just... Mm. It's just a form of groupthink and normal government behaviour. And that's that's why it's so important to keep debating and talking and putting forward alternative views so people can pick and choose and find their own best way forward. You, you said when you resigned that uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't just for all the Plan B stuff coming back, but also about the general direction of travel of a supposedly uh, conservative government. So I take it uh, things like net zero and all that are problematic for you too. Yeah, I think it's, um, 
it's uh, only partly a conservative free market government. That's that's the problem. And I don't think conservatives should be raising taxes in the way that we've we've decided to. I don't think we should be rushing at the net zero policy in quite the way that we're we're doing at the moment. Climate change is a problem. I don't think it's by any means the most serious problem the country faces. We need to be much, much more serious about deregulating, sweeping away regulation, changing things, doing things differently, so that we, we get the benefits of, of what we've done. If we know anything from the last 200 years, it's that free markets, free economies, free choice, ability to pursue your own destiny and choose your own futures mm. and provide for your family, that produces prosperity. And we move away from that uh, at our peril, I think. So that was, that was my, my concern. I'm not saying the picture is entirely bleak. The government has done some good things like the, the ARIA science research uh, uh, sort of agency that's being set up and one or two other things. But in general, I feel we've, we've drifted away from where the centre of gravity of uh, the, is of the people that, that elected us. There's a, there's a sense among despairing Tories that a lot of the issues of most concern to them, for example, the uh, migrants arriving on the southern coast uh, every night, that, that they're beyond the capability of politicians to solve them. Because for whatever reason, people have concluded there are legal obstacles to doing anything about it. You've actually had charge of one of those issues uh, in terms of the Irish border and uh, where it has managed to be moved by very successfully in some ways by Brussels is it is it just that is it just increasingly hard uh, even for a government with an 80 seat majority in the commons to 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 rouse itself to push back on these things so i think modern governments are uh, enmeshed in a web of treaty commitments, of international commitments, of previous legislation, of assumptions and custom and practice about how you do things. And in this country, um, in particular, those treaties are interpreted by, by judges and lawyers and in-house lawyers in government in, in particular ways. And it can be really difficult to shake yourself free from that and, and realise that other courses of action are, are possible. I think what we have seen in the last few years, and Brexit was, was part of it, but it's not the only part of it, is, is a sense that you know, these sort of webs based on international institutions, ways of doing things, are not necessarily in the interests of everybody in, in, in a country. And you know, what we were trying to do with the protocol and, and what Liz Truss is still going to be trying to do is, is work within that framework to try and get to a a better outcome and it is extremely difficult uh, it's uh, uh, it, it may not be achievable and we may have to to take different routes but did, did nobody back when the Belfast agreement the Good Friday agreement was being negotiated nobody in British politics thought it would have any impact on membership of the European Union did they? I mean, that sort of came out of the blue, didn't it? It was very cleverly seized on, but it's not something that a I doubt anybody in Dublin thought during that time that it had anything to do with European Union membership. No, obviously the, the Good Friday Agreement is, is about peace in, in Northern Ireland. And, you know, at that time, mm. uh, nobody thought that, that we might exit the, the European Union. But that doesn't make... I, I think the problem we've got now is that the, the protocol is actually undermining the, the Good Friday Agreement. It was, it was agreed in mm. extremely difficult circumstances when um, you know, we've been handed a, a, a really poor draft agreement by our, our predecessors that wouldn't go through Parliament. We had Parliament blocking us leaving without any agreement, mm. with, without an agreement. So. We had to do the best we could, and we prioritised certain things. We were doubtful, I was certainly doubtful, that, that some of the protocol would, would, would work well. Um, and it needed really careful handling, and it hasn't got it. So, to me, it's obvious that the protocol is going to have to be 
significantly renegotiated or replaced. That's the point we've got to. And the only question really is how much pain are we going to have to go through? How complicated is it going to be? How long is it going to take before the EU realise that? But, but it's obvious that's what's got to happen. It's only a matter of time. Let me just let me just put to you uh, the the emails we've had a lot of in one variation of another. The, after all the party gate stuff and the wine bottles in a suitcase, people want you to come back as Boris Johnson's chief of staff. I take that I can't even see that, so I take it that's a that's a kind of non-starter. And the other and the other group of people say uh, see you as a prime ministerial candidate along with all these other, like your chum Liz Truss and these uh, various other people who've been mentioned. Do you see yourself as a prime ministerial candidate? And is that actually uh, possible? I don't know. I don't understand Tony Blair's wreckage of the House of Lords in full, but I do know that at, at the time of uh, the 14th Earl of Hume, it wasn't possible to renounce a life peerage or a peerage of the first creation. So I'm not sure whether you can become Prime Minister, but uh, are you up for it? Well, I must admit I've not looked into the detail of that, and I think that that is for a good reason, which is that it's uh, a long time since this country has had a, a Prime Minister in the Lords, and I, I don't think it's what it's crying out for at the moment as a, a solution to, to the country's problems. So, so no, I don't, I don't think that's, that's uh, the best way of proceeding. Look, it's only, it's only a month since I left government. I think it's a bit soon to be talking about going back in, in any capacity. Um, never say never to anything, but actually I think the Prime Minister, if he's going to succeed over the next year or two, he probably needs new people around him and new ways of doing things and a new policy prescription. Those people can, can help him deliver and I'll, I'll be very happy to support that if we can, if we can get on that track. When you give these, these speeches, certainly the Lisbon speech, which, which was riffing off uh, a pamphlet of, of Edmund Burke's, you see the sweep of history. Uh, we seem to be at one of those hinge moments where after a period of uh, half a millennium of Euro-American domination, the Chinese now see the world returning to its rightful masters. Do you think there's a general crisis uh, just just quickly as a final question, do you think there's a general crisis in the West? Yeah, I think some of the things that have made the West strong, we're, we're undervaluing spirit of free inquiry, standing up for our own values, you know, supporting democracy. I do think, I mean, China is, is obviously a massive world player. It, it, it always will be. And, but, but I don't think that, I think we need to be a bit more clear-sighted in the UK about the extent to which we've outsourced our own industrial capacity to China, you know, the, the kind of influence that China has in the UK in various ways. And I think we need to be a bit, a bit tougher about that and a bit more clear-sighted. And I think the West needs to generally, if we're going to stick to what's made us succeed uh, in the 21st century as we did in the 20th. Absolutely. That's uh, very true. We need to be, if we're going to survive, we need to be true to ourselves and our best traditions. Uh, Lord Frost at Liberty, as uh, resting actors used to say. Great to see you. We're all out of time.